Hi, I'm John Silva, and this is Art and Design. Today, my guest is Bob Gibbs. Bob, thanks for coming on the show. Good morning. Um, Bob, you are a landscape architect. How did you get into uh, landscape architecture? Um, I had got a master's degree from the University of Michigan. They have a program that specializes in that. And uh, started practicing downtown Detroit for one of the uh, urban planning firms, Sherry Schwogel Mers, which is now Hamilton Anderson. Which is one of the most visible one over yeah. the last decade for sure. The yeah. Hamilton Anderson's been involved in a lot mm -hmm. of projects, right? Right. And, and then, now you're on your own, right? I'm on my own. I have my own company, Gibbs Planning Group. We've been in business since 1988, and we've been based downtown Birmingham for over 30 years. Now, uh, I was going to ask you because one of the things that you do is um, master plans for cities. This is one of many things that you do. Mm -hmm. How does that contract take place when you're dealing with the city? How, is the, how do you come together with them? And then what takes place after you come to an agreement mm -hmm. to do the master plan? About half of our clients are cities. And uh, they usually come to us because they're facing some challenge. Either the downtown is in a downward spiral and they want to revitalize the downtown or just the opposite. They're having too much growth and they have traffic congestion and unplanned sprawl. So it's very competitive. They send out requests for proposals and we have to bid with other firms, interview and then uh, hopefully get the project. Well, and it's a, it's a relationship, right? It's, it's almost like online dating because you mm -hmm. have to understand who the client is, mm -hmm. what their needs through a needs assessment mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. and then you have to open it up to the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the best plans really are ground up plans where you pull ideas out of the public and get their buy-in. So we use a process called the planning charrette, which is a fancy name for a workshop where we have hundreds or thousands of residents come in every day. We move our office to the city, rent, an, rent a storefront, and move our office and all the consultants into a city, and literally plan the plan right in front of their eyes. We uh, come up with a new alternative or two or three alternatives every day and present it to them publicly, get their feedback, and then during the daytime we also hold focus groups and interviews. We'll meet with the senior citizens and the civic groups and the young families and the business owners and, and get their input. And it really builds a good plan because we may go through 15 alternatives and give feedback every night and revitalize the plans really on the fly. And by the time we go through those alternatives, we can usually get a consensus that people will buy into. Well, this, this process of doing a charrette with the general public, mm -hmm. you get all extremes, too, when it comes to viewpoints, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are polar opposites. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to build that consensus, do you, I mean, I know you do, but is there a format that you can summarize? There, um, are, there are really passionate people with pretty radical or extreme views. And we treat them all fairly. We draw up their ideas uh, all to a very high level. So if somebody says, let's pay you over the park and make it into a big parking lot, we will actually draw that and show it and, and treat, give it respect and present that. And usually the really awful ideas sort of just die a natural death when they're presented. But we don't try to squelch it and say, no, don't do that. We'll actually give it uh, justice and present it. And we find that when people sit around the table and they listen to each other's point of view, um, they compromise. And they realize that you know, the fire marshal may want an extra wide street so he can get his ladders out. But when he sees a young family with children concerned about the speed of a wide street, sometimes they'll, they'll modify their point of view. So it's, it's almost a therapy session for cities to go through. And um, it's important to have a consensus. We've uh, done plans where 20 years later, people will still stand up and say, no, we wanted to be a city, or we wanted to be a small town, or yes, we're OK with people living in apartments near my neighborhood, or things like that. Well, <clears throat> now, just to give that visual, mm -hmm. number one, 
I love that you bring the whole firm to a storefront downtown mm -hmm. so it's accessible mm -hmm. and people can come and go and people yeah. can present their ideas. But the other thing is what you just described is extremely time consuming. Mm -hmm. And to, to treat everyone equitable mm -hmm. is a testament to you and your approach by mm -hmm. saying, let's explore it. We're going to take the time to draw this right. up and show you what it will actually look like. Don't just say it. We'll draw it up based on what you're interested in. And that's, that's beautiful that you would take the time mm -hmm. to give that, that voice. Our, our, our only real hard rule is not uh, to say no or not to say that's a bad idea until it's actually illustrated. And uh, sometimes the strangest idea ends up being everybody's favorite. <laughs> and uh, it, the, the citizens really make us look smart because we're really drawing their ideas. And it really helps. Well, I'm going to say that that's a testament to you by actually giving that voice mm -hmm. and putting it to paper Mm -hmm. and showing them that, hey, there's no bad ideas. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, through, through all the parties, all the mm -hmm. concerned parties mm -hmm. and all the rules that are mm -hmm. govern this area, we just got to put it through and see mm -hmm. if it'll, it'll pass. Right. And the designers are designing in the storefront while we're holding focus group interviews. So they have one ear listening to what people are saying and another ear looking at each other's ideas and they and they tend to steal each other's really good ideas or if, some, if everybody likes a concept that evening everybody will go back and do their own spin on the concept so a lot of it is just the consensus building but also being creative and understanding engineering and economics and listening to the business owners and the store owners say we really do need signs or we really do need uh, parking in front of our stores so we bring in a lot of experts to do that. Well, and, and um, you just gave some examples of what that too. Be, mm -hmm. But when people think about their downtown mm -hmm. or their city mm -hmm. and what they want to see, it's everything. Like you mentioned, signage, wayfinding, placemaking, mm -hmm. um, down to the park benches and where they're positioned mm -hmm. and where you want people to be able to sit versus where they are currently located, if there are any at all. That's right. Uh, it gets to a very fine detail, but also very big picture. What's the, what role do you want your city or town to be? Do you want it to remain a village, or do you want to grow to be a town, or do you want to grow to be a city? Um, and cities have responsibilities. Uh, one of the best uh, ways of curbing sprawl and really saving the, and preserving the farmland and woodlands is to have more people living in the cities. And so th we feel that um, it's important for cities to accept growth and to allow people to live in the cities and shop and to put the shops and types of businesses people want to have in the downtowns. Um, we feel that every house we can get into a downtown is one less house maybe out in a suburb someday. And the demographics are changing for people to move into cities, as you probably know. Uh, people my age, the empty nesters, very much uh, are selling their large suburban four bedroom homes and wanting to downsize to a more compact walk um, condo or apartment where they can live in a city where they can park their car and walk to a coffee shop or walk to a restaurant and the millennials too the millennials are about half of them very much want to live in cities so half of them still like living in the suburbs but about half want to live in cities that are walkable when they live in subdivisions, they want sidewalks and they want to be able to walk to a Starbucks or to a coffee shop. Uh, that generation's clubhouse is a Starbucks or a restaurant. Um, our generation wanted to live on a golf course, uh, but they've, they're uh, veering from that now to live in downtowns. I happen to think the golf courses would make great sculpture parks. They could, and there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Ooh. A lot of people, about I think 50,000 people a year, are quitting golf right now. Man, you're making my day. <laughs> I think we can so, work on this, Bob. A lot of golf courses are being changed over to other uses. Hmm, I yeah. see potential. Mm -hmm. There's <laughs> a lot of potential, and civic art is very important in cities. We're advocates for that. Um, for the well-being and the culture of people, but also it makes good economic sense. Studies have shown that property values are higher, retail sales are higher, restaurants do better if there's strong civic art. 
and a lot of communities um, require that a small percentage, a half a percent or a quarter percent of the building uh, pro um, costs go into a civic art fund or building civic art um, in the downtown. And a lot of employer, major employers right now look for cities or places that are creative so they can attract the creative, smart Harvard grad or the Stanford grad. And one of the ways they look for that are with murals or sculpture or uh, innovative streetscapes and the building design. Well, and, and I'm going to reference Robert Florida, who mm -hmm. talked about the creative class, mm -hmm. and the state of Michigan actually bought into that about 15 years mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. And it's it ebbs and flows, mm -hmm. but all along, you're mm -hmm. backing it up with these statistics right now that, mm -hmm. you know, a creative community that shows they support the arts actually gets much more in return. That's right, and it's a um, it's a very competitive job market right now. And you'll see a lot of major employers moving into downtown Detroit or downtowns like Birmingham or Farmington or Rochester so that they can offer their employees a more challenging and interesting lifestyle and work habit. And so for competitive reasons, uh, retail employers are going to downtowns. Well, and, and again, like you mentioned, the, the dynamics have changed for boomers as well as millennials mm -hmm. and no. their focus. Um, do you see this as a trend or do you think that this is the wave for the future? I, I think it's, um, I think the cities are gonna be around for a long time and I, I think um, again about a half to two thirds of the buyers today want to live in a walkable urban environment. And uh, which is fine. About a third or a half don't. They want to stay in a suburb on a half acre lot or acre lot, which is fine. But the industry for years, maybe 20, 30 years, almost since World War II, hadn't been building walkable places. And that's starting, that started again about 20 years ago with a movement called the a New Urbanist. The Congress for New Urbanism was formed in the 1980s to. Uh, provide an alternative, a walkable alternative to suburbs. And that is the hot spot now for real estate developers. Housing developers like to build new urban walkable communities and retailers and restaurants like to be in those places. And Michigan has about eight or nine pretty successful new urban communities. It was one of the pioneers in doing that. And um, I think more are to, are to come. You wanna highlight any of those and give an example? Well, uh, we worked on one in a canton called Cherry Hill, which is a, the largest one in Michigan. It's about two to 300 acres, and it has a variety of housing, uh, single family homes, cottage homes, townhomes, apartments, lofts, and retail. Uh, the first one in Michigan uh, is at Losser and 13. It's called Westwood Common. It was a plan uh, developed by David Jensen. We were the planner. And it's a little pocket neighborhood of 25 homes clustered around in English clothes. And so there's a little square. The garages are on the back of the homes, and you have this nice little village. Uh, we planned one in Birmingham called Eaton Station in the rail district for uh, Crosswinds, Bernie Gleiberman. Mm -hmm, Bernie. And that's about <laughs> uh, 200 uh, live-work townhomes. Live-works are where you live on top of a shop on the first level and then the shop can be your business or you can rent it out as income. And that's the largest, I think, live work community in the country in, in Birmingham. Well, and Bernie led the way, not just with the one in Birmingham, but throughout the state he had a number of these that he replicated. Yeah, Mr. Gleiberman really was the pioneer, Michigan's urban developer pioneer. He really introduced townhomes to Michigan and uh, early 90s he did the ones in Royal Oak and did them downtown um, in Midtown he, he really was the pioneer but he it was uh, and I, I don't mean to pick on Bernie but the whole thing is he's a great example of someone who went into these communities mm -hmm. and said here's this large unused mm -hmm. piece of property mm -hmm. I see potential mm -hmm. and he built it and they did come and they were full he really uh, is a visionary and he um, did a lot of research about demographics and he said, well, there's this group coming along that are 19 and 20 year olds that don't want to live in a suburb. They want to live in a walkable place and they're willing to give up a little privacy 
and uh, maybe hear their neighbor through the walls or something as long as we can give them a nice place to walk to. Well, uh, I had a personal experience with Bernie at that time. I was pitching him public art, mm -hmm. which wasn't a pitch at all. Mm -hmm. He was embracing it 100% mm -hmm. for the rail district. And so we had this long conversation and I got to see what he was up against with mm -hmm. city planning commissions mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. number of meetings that he had mm -hmm. to go through. Because this was mm -hmm. a, a brand new idea mm -hmm. in a very tight knit city that mm -hmm. wasn't possibly open to new ideas at the time. So I commend him on yeah. his fortitude and seeing it through and keeping the vision alive. Yeah, this kind of compact, dense planning is counterintuitive. A lot of people believe less is more. The fewer homes that live per acre, the better. Um, and the idea of some of these densities, sometimes we get 30, 40 houses per acre density. We put retail on the ground level and people live up above it. And it's a foreign idea that uh, it's hard for people to embrace. Now, once they see it, then they, they'd say, I'd like to live there. Uh, so, but it's, 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 it's always the as problem. An, as an abstract. It's the visualization, yeah. yeah. But um, Birmingham, Birmingham was a good example. Birmingham's probably one of the top five cities in the Midwest, maybe, maybe one of the top 10 in the country. It's only 20,000 people, but it has the walkability and the commercial of a major city. And it's a good model when people are tenant about it, we'll bring them to Birmingham or Franklin or a little village or Rochester and say, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, we planned the village of Rochester for the Aikens group uh, about 25 years ago. That was an enclosed mall, the Meadowbrook Mall. Mm -hmm. That was mostly vacant and they came to us and we said, let's build the street. Let's tear the mall down and build the street and uh, introduce that concept to Michigan. It was a radical concept for Rochester Hills, uh, but they embraced it, and now once it's built, people say, oh, that's great, of course it was a good idea. <laughs> I remember the uh, homeowners around, uh, around it oh, were, yeah. didn't really want, they, I, they insisted on major barriers and buffers mm -hmm. and trees and all that, and so we gave it to them. And then later some of them told me, well, why did you exclude me? I'd like to walk to Starbucks and I'd like to walk here. You know, you should put a path to my neighborhood. Well. And we designed it so we can recognize that. subdivision that. right behind it. I remember mm -hmm. the dialogue in the yeah. late 80s. I yeah. was in that sub while the transformation mm -hmm. was coming through. Yeah. And it's fear. People are always afraid of the unknown. Yeah. And right. But that's back to the testament mm -hmm. of you and your process for a shred. Just moving yeah. the offices to an accessible location yeah. downtown is a great move. Yeah. It says, look, come yeah. in, talk to us. Yeah. We want your input. Right, people will sit right next to the planners. They'll say, why don't you move this here, or this, why don't you do this, or I want bigger trees, or whatever. We walk around with tape measures, uh, and we measure everything. We have notebooks, so uh, we, we know what, what we like for a park size. Parks tend to be, parks, the smaller parks tend to be more successful than the big parks. Parks can be too big. So, uh, we, we have good comfort feeling for the street widths and design and, and details like that. But people have to see it. People are always skeptical of change. Well, and uh, again, a testament to you that you're giving them their voice, mm -hmm. where um, if they don't feel like they're heard, that mm -hmm. means they're going to resist mm -hmm. all throughout mm -hmm. the process. But if you say, yeah. no, let's draw it, especially right. if you're mm -hmm. taking the time to draw their mm -hmm. idea, mm -hmm. they know you're listening to them. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah, then they be, have ownership in the plan. They'll, they'll say to their children, look, that was my idea to mm -hmm. put a park there, or that was my idea to put a fountain there or something. And it's always a better plan. I mean, oh, yeah. the ideas of many are better than oh, the ideas the, of one. The buy-in and yeah. ownership, like yeah. you said, going mm -hmm. forward, they can, mm -hmm. they're your best PR agents. Yeah. Right. So, right. But it's also a testament, again, to, you, to being patient. Because mm -hmm. when I think of design, it's very difficult sometimes when you as the mm -hmm. designer mm -hmm. have an idea mm -hmm. and have experience mm -hmm. and best practices mm -hmm. and you come mm -hmm. into a community mm -hmm. and you go, oh, this would be great. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that yeah. without people buying yeah. into it. So uh, when we uh, start a plan, if we're going to start with a new site, we uh, identify the site's natural features. We'll do a tree survey and, and find all the landmark trees or the nice hedgerows or find the nice hill or the wetland. 
and we start by saying that's going to be a park and then we design the rest of the community around those landmarks so that we don't at the end of the plan say oh by the way oh, it's too bad there's a hedgerow it's in the wrong place we start with the natural features and then set those aside and make them preserved and uh, that's a good real estate play too um, studies have shown that people that can uh, live to a walking trail or to a nature preserve homes are worth sometimes up to 20 percent more that's happening in Atlanta right now with the green belt around Atlanta. It was very controversial, but uh, the homes now are high, worth more the closer they are to the green belt. Uh, same thing with introducing commercial. Um, if you can walk to a coffee shop or to a green grocer, homes are valued at 12 to 18 percent more. And so when we plan a neighborhood, we want to plan uh, little neighborhood shops. Uh, Birmingham has that. It has the, uh, the Mills Pharmacy and the Holiday Market is a classic example of little, little neighborhood shops. So if you live in the Seaholm neighborhood or the Linden Park or the Quarton Lake, uh, you have the luxury of being able to walk uh, to get a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk or, or prescription filled. And your children have the luxury of being able to bike around and not have to be chauffeured everywhere. Uh, those are called free-range chicken, uh, free-range children now. <laughs> I was going to say chicken, Different free-range yeah. uh, children, uh, which is the new luxury. A lot of young families want their children to be able to ride their bicycles safely to a school or to get a, a, a grocery or a popsicle or something on their own. And that's the new luxury that a lot of people are looking for. Well, I've I, I got a question for you, Bob, too. Have you always thought about landscape and design or was this something through your education and experience mm -hmm. that you put more thought into it? Uh, I always liked design. Um, my favorite class was drafting when I was in middle school and I've always uh, liked architecture and had inspired to, to be in the design pr profession. I attended Oakland University and got a liberal arts degree there and then went to the University of Michigan and got a master's in landscape architecture. So yeah, I was always interested in, I grew up near Cranbrook, so I would spend all my free time studying Saarinen's genius work there and under, trying to understand the symmetry. Uh, the, in Saarinen's period, architects uh, developed what's called a gift to the street. And they would put a little piece of art on the buildings at street level so that the buildings would enhance the street. And so I, I always have been interested in Places and design. Um, did you have Sven Burkitz ever for any classes at U of M? I no. know he was architecture, but no, I didn't know I if didn't. anything overlapped. No, no I mean, didn't. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, like as we have this conversation, I think of my own mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. and I think, how did I make this decision, mm -hmm. and what were mm -hmm. the key factors? Mm -hmm. And I think um, I might not have put as many factors into it it was there's a number of influences mm -hmm. affordability mm -hmm. timing what was available mm -hmm. all these different things mm -hmm. but it also makes you think well where would I go if I didn't mm -hmm. live here mm -hmm. and everything you're saying as a mm -hmm. landscape architect mm -hmm. really leads me into wow here's some of the positives mm -hmm. I do have mm -hmm. and do I even utilize those mm -hmm. positives mm -hmm. which I think because of the environment that people are in they might mm -hmm. not give extra thought to things that they would by having the opportunity to talk to you and your experience you know, and raise ideas that could make it better. It, it's, it's really important in the design process, as you know, is to look at all prudent alternatives. A lot of people will come to me and say, this is what I, I, I want to build this and this and this, and I know exactly what it's going to look like. Basically, can you be my drafts person? So we'll draft up their idea but we'll also say, oh, by the way, here are three or four other options that uh, you may want to consider. And it really, usually it ends up being a hybrid combination, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But the design process is important to go through. But that relationship that a, mm -hmm. um, a consumer mm -hmm. has with you as a designer, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like a psychiatrist. Right, yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's the it's like um, I equate it to painting your house, sanding the walls and taping the walls and windows and all that. The prep, picking out the color, is 
the hard part. Actually rolling the paint on the walls and painting is the easy part, and it's the same way with planning and design. It's the research about what the development's gonna be like if we're doing a, a neighborhood, if we're planning a new apartment community or something. It's the programming and research and prep work, and once we get that out of the way, the planning goes very, very quickly. Well, and, and that, that planning is an act of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it and, is. And with, with the mm -hmm. consumer, um, is there any mm -hmm. experience that you've had with somebody where the light bulbs went off? Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's life-altering. Mm -hmm. If they take the time to hire you, yeah. it can be life-altering and make mm -hmm. them question what they've done their whole life it through that self-discovery. It's an educational process, and really my role is to be a facilitator. Uh, there are times where we'll have to stop and say, uh, this is against our principles. Uh, we, had a, we did a community in Howell, Howell Town Commons, where we wanted to put the senior center across the street from the daycare center. Research shows mm -hmm. seniors live longer and have higher quality of life if they see children. Well, the planning commission at the time said, we don't think seniors should be near children. And we, we had to say it's against our principle. We delayed the project for a while. Um, so sometimes we have to either stop or try to try to convince somebody to do something. But we do have basic principles that we, we follow and we adhere to. And that's one reason we're such a small firm. Sometimes we just have to politely part ways and say, go see Joe or go see whomever. And uh, they can help you probably better than I. We don't do communities where the garages are in the front of the houses. Uh, we like the garages to be in the back, and we like the living rooms and porches to be in the fronts of the communities. We think that's more walkable and more social. And when you put communities with all garages in the front, you're really just creating alleys. And these best practices, which that's mm -hmm. what they are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or principles mm -hmm. in this case as well. Mm -hmm. I love that you present those mm -hmm. and you have the, the standard mm -hmm. that you won't go beyond too. Right, and, and surprisingly, when I, uh, when I tell a client that it's against my principles, and this is why, uh, they almost always say, okay, I, I, I'll go, I'll accept that. Well, that's a testament to you mm -hmm. and your approach mm -hmm. with your customer, especially mm -hmm. you know going forward it's only going to be an issue mm -hmm. if they don't buy into this, this set response. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, my last thing, how mm -hmm. do people get a hold of you if they want to find out more about you and what mm -hmm. your firm does? Uh, we're the Gibbs Planning Group. We're in uh, downtown Birmingham. On Shane, we're on the north side of Shane Park. And uh, we're in the internet and web and all that. And we'd be delighted to hear from people. Thank Thanks you very much. Thanks for coming much. on. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, John.